Hello. Our story begins on Tatooine. Anakin Skywalker is walking back to his homestead to finally see his mother and little brother. Anakin was seven years old and his little brother, Zane, was two years younger than him. Zane would have to start at Water's shop soon, and he was very worried about it. Living in the Outer Rim wasn't a dream, but having to deal with what was allowed by the crime lords was brutal to say the least. When Anakin returned, the home was quiet. Too quiet. Something within him told him that something was wrong. The moment the door closed behind him, he searched for the light switch. Typically, their small home had enough light to be given them visibility during the day, but it was dark. A little uncanny, to be honest. Anakin got some lights to glow, but it was nothing short of dim. He couldn't see much, and he moved forward and stumbled over something and fell onto his face. Anakin got back up and called out to his mom. He then continued and called out Zane's name. No response. He could hear a number of boxes shuffling around. Who was there? He grabbed the closest object to him and moved forward, preparing to swing for whatever came out. Anakin stepped forward and kicked something with his foot. That was odd. It wasn't a piece of furniture, it almost felt human. What happened next would only haunt Anakin more than what his imagination could come up with in the seconds since hitting the object. He reached down and felt skin, and he touched the hand. This wasn't just any ordinary person's hand, it was his mother's. He felt liquid on his own hand and pulled it up back towards his face and saw shining crimson. Anakin let out a startled scream, and from the shuffling, a little voice called out. It was Zane. He asked if Anakin was okay, and Anakin asked where he was. The two brothers converged on each other, both of them very shaken, very startled. Zane told Anakin they needed to get out of the house. Anakin asked why, and Zane told him that Watto sent some thugs here to kill Shmi. Why would he do that? Well, with Zane becoming a slave tomorrow, he no longer needed an elder woman. Maybe it wasn't exactly resourceful, but Watto wanted to ensure these boys had no one to go to, essentially taking them and making them reliant on him. Anakin and Zane grabbed a hold of each other and ran out of the residence. Zane explained that their mother was dead, and the two of them ran out into the streets horrified. Anakin wiped the dry blood off of his hands and onto his tunic, only to see that his younger brother was covered in it. What had Zane seen? The two of them ran into an alleyway for a moment and decided that they needed to do something about this. But they had no money, no mom, no help. The only other person they knew or talked to was Watto, and it was clear that he was behind this. Watto was a slug. Zane asked his older brother what they should do about it. Anakin paced back and forth inside the alleyway and suggested that they get Watto back. They could kill him and take his money. It seemed like a good idea on the surface, but how would they kill him? His shop frequently had people in it. Zane suggested they leave a trap, something that could clip one of his wings so they could rush him. Anakin thought this was a good idea. Anakin remembered something that Watto hadn't had the time to fix. It was a little tile on the ceiling that was essentially falling in. If they could put blades on it or something, it could be pretty funny. Anakin asked, just to be entirely sure, that it was indeed Watto who did this. Zane asked if Watto was at the shop earlier, and Anakin shook his head. Zane expressed that Watto didn't come into the house. Rather, he waited outside. Shmi saw him and told Zane to go hide for the time being, and then she was killed. Zane came out to the sound of commotion, and that was probably the worst mistake he could have made. He had solid bruise lines across his cheek, but he was alright. It wasn't anything compared to the horror he saw when his mother was killed in front of him. Regardless, the two of them got to the shop in the late hours of the night, and then hid out in the junkyard until the morning. When the twin sons rose, the two brothers waited for a little while. Watto came to work after Anakin did. It was a benefit of child labor. He didn't have to be up on time, and Anakin could deal with potential customers until Watto was ready. That wasn't the case today, and Watto could see that Anakin wasn't in his shop, considering it was still closed. He unlocked the doors angrily and floated in. Within a moment of the door shutting behind him, he let out a terrible squeal. Anakin grabbed a shank he had himself in the yard and ran into the shop. He ran forward with his little brother behind him. Anakin jumped up and got Watto good with a solid strike. He was so unprepared, and then when the seven-year-old jumped down on him, he was dragged to the ground and the two brothers kicked him until he died. They looked at each other, a sense of disbelief sat on their faces, but their calmness was met with terror. Someone knocked at the door asking if everything was alright. Anakin and Zane turned pale, looking at the door and then to each other, and then the yard behind them. They took off running as fast as their legs could carry them. Anakin pushed Zane in front of him. Zane was obviously much shorter than Anakin, and he wasn't as physically strong as his older brother, but being pushed did help. The two of them slid out the back and turned a corner and started running away. People started discovering the murder of Watto and seeing a couple kids, one of which worked for Watto, running away, only seemed to be the correct culprit. Anakin and Zane ran through the streets, sticking with each other, dodging and hiding over and under objects. They had a little advantage with their small size, being able to duck in and out of places that some adults would struggle with. However, it didn't get them as far as they would like. Considering this was such an uncharacteristic murder committed by two children, when they were captured they would be taken to the daimyo of Mosespa. But not just Mosespa, Tatooine. 
Jabba the Hutt was the most powerful crime lord of any of the Hutts anywhere in the galaxy, likely one of the most powerful beings in the galaxy as well. The Skywalker brothers were captured one at a time, but they were both taken to Jabba's palace across the city. When they got to the palace, their confidence dissipated. It only worsened when they were presented to Jabba the Hutt himself. He wasn't too bothered. He actually enjoyed the prospect of feeding people to the Sarlacc pit. He had about 20 prisoners that he would execute for various crimes. However, these kids were here for a reason. For a kid to commit such an egregious murder, the daimyo wanted to see what their worth was. The brothers were thrown down in front of Jabba and he simply requested they inform him of why they killed a random shop owner. Anakin stood up believing that he could spare his younger brother from any punishment. He told Jabba that the shop owner called for the murder of their mothers and they were protecting her honor. Jabba asked what their status was inside of Mos Espa. The two of them looked at each other and Zane told him that they were slaves. Jabba scowled. Slaves who killed their owners never got free passes. However, there was never a case on Tatooine of a child slave killing their owner without the assistance of a parent or an adult of some sort. Typically for Jabba, a child accompanied by an adult would face the same crime as an adult, which would likely result in death by the Sarlacc Pit. With such circumstances of these two children being left on their own and choosing themselves over servitude, Jabba actually appreciated them. Sure, they were rebels, but at the very least they could become decent bounty hunters or smugglers in the future. They showed no signs of trouble when it came to killing someone even as children. So, surely if he placed them with a bounty hunter then they would be worth his time when they were adults. Plus, in Jabba's own mind, they were his type of scum, so he would greatly enjoy getting a use out of them as they got older. Jabba was a crime lord, and for two kids to complete a murder, it was something that could be turned into usefulness in the future. Without an adult accompanying them, it meant that they had potential and sturdiness. They had the ability to become a Jango Fed if they put themselves up to it. All that mattered was their willingness to comply. Jabba told his protocol droid to inform them that they were welcome to stay here and join his scum inside the palace. They'd be paired up with a bounty hunter eventually, but the two boys were famished. With Jabba's approval, they were then seen with respect within the palace, and people immediately gave them the respect they deserved. Most of the bounty hunters, smugglers, and scum didn't have an issue with it. They were kids, no reason to get up in your head about being favored by Jabba. They weren't rivals and they could be influenced like someone so that it could be mutually beneficial for the bounty hunters themselves. Anakin and Zane turned to each other and jumped up, hugging each other. They survived the coolest being across this side of the galaxy. Not only did they survive, but they got his approval. The boys turned around. There was a smuggler who was out of his mind. Ten sheets to the wind to say the least, and he came over and brought the boys to his table. They had a number of drinks on the table, but the biggest allure was a food. Being slaves, they didn't get to get good food, but Jabba's palace had some fine delicacies. For the daimyo, it was expected. His scum brought back what he wanted, and he gave them food and credits. What a dream. Anakin and Zane were tossed a couple of trays of food, and they filled themselves up, while the palace got exciting. Jabba's performers came in, and people were in great amusement and having great fun. After eating more food than they'd seen in their lives, Anakin and Zane were left almost comatose, but happier than they ever thought they could be. The two of them sat at the back of a booth. In front of them, a smuggler and a bounty hunter played Spock, and a number of others gathered around them and started betting. It was awesome. The two of them leaned against each other and talked about how cool this life was. Anakin told his younger brother that they could be rich someday. Maybe they would have the ability to be Jabba's favorites. Zane told Anakin that he wanted to eat like this for the rest of his life. They were super excited about the possibilities of this new lifestyle style, though the reality of the situation is that they were trying to forget about how badly their mother's death affected them. In the last 24 hours, they lost their mother, committed murder, and were respected by one of the most ruthless individuals in the entire galaxy. Over the coming days, the two brothers would spend their time in Jabba's palace, waiting for Jabba to pair them up with someone. Five days after they killed Wado, they were handed over to a young, vibrant bounty hunter whose name was Rain. She was new to the scene and she was excitable towards the prospect of gaining favorability with Jabba. However, she wasn't thrilled when she was handed two children. Her name was Rain and she was from the planet of Ryloth. She was able to bounce off world when she turned 16 and she was currently 18. Her first bounty was for one of Jabba's relatives named Zero the Hutt. It was a contract job that she got over Hollow recording on Tatooine, but she had to travel back to Coruscant for the job. That was something obviously hard for her to do, but it was necessary and it worked out in her favor. She gained respect from Zero, who had very little expectations, and it gained notability with Jabba. Not much, but enough. She over the past two years was able to get jobs with both of them. She came back to Tatooine to deliver a job for Jabba before heading back to Coruscant to work for Zero. She had a contract pending with Zero, and she had to deliver before he got impatient. She wasn't fond of having to drag two kids back with her to Coruscant, but she obliged because it meant that she would earn more notoriety. Rain took the two boys back to her starship. It wasn't the prettiest hunk of junk in the galaxy, but it got from point A to point B, and to Rain, that's all that mattered. Anakin and Zane didn't care. It was their first time inside of a starship. This was incredible. 
they were getting off of Tatooine, no reason for them to complain here. For a couple of weeks they would trail around with rain, and all would be fine. Coruscant was such an incredible planet and they enjoyed being here, though for the most part, they were working with Rain on operations down below. A couple of the more dangerous missions they were left inside of Zero's club, which wasn't a big deal, especially since Zero had to obey what his cousin said. If he wanted the kids with Rain, then he would have to accept that. That's where they'd be. Anakin and Zane enjoyed being in Zero's club because it was very bougie to say the least. It was upper class and people from Coruscant did come to it. Though it wasn't ordinary people, many of them were just getting their lives started in the crime world, and Zero was their way in. Connections for Jabba and so forth. After a couple weeks of in and out of the underworld, Rain would be given the incentive to take the boys with her for the time being. She complied and went back down to the lower levels with Anakin and Zane. Zero essentially said to her that they were driving away customers, which wasn't true. He then threatened her for bringing them to his establishment, making her feel that the pressure was on her to keep them away from him. Because if she didn't, according to Zero, he would put a bounty on her head. He really didn't have any intentions of doing so, and the kids didn't actually bother him, but he didn't want them in his club. They didn't fit the vibe, and most people who saw them either ignored them or allowed them to sit in because they didn't want to bother anyone. With Rain under the impression that her life was at risk because of these two boys, she brought them down to the most crime-filled section of Coruscant. The underworld was filled with these different places in the Undercity, but this was by far the worst part. Crime was at its highest down here, and Coruscant police, even the droid police, didn't come down here. It was that bad. It was as bad as most outer rim places planets, just in one condensed sector of a massive city. Rain took the boys down to the city and then promptly shot Anakin in the back of the calf. Zane was more concerned about his older brother, and by the time he turned around the girl had run off. Part of her felt bad for it, as she reached her ship, but at the same time it wasn't any of her business. And not for nothing, they'd be rivals to her anyways in the future. Surely she could have looked after them like they were her own, but she didn't need tagalongs, she needed credits. Zane tried to help Anakin, but terror filled both of their minds. Anakin was badly injured and could hardly walk, and Zane was barely big enough to help Anakin walk as it was. It was quite a predicament, especially with all these noises that they were hearing. The boys thought about how good their life had been for days and the weeks leading up to this moment. Now they had nothing but each other. The two of them got themselves into an alleyway and bundled down for the night. Coruscant was much colder than Tatooine and they had to stay warm to survive. As the night carried on, they heard the sounds of gunshots and battles happening, people screaming it was an endless night of terror. When the morning came, they decided that they needed to get Anakin some help. His leg was starting to get infected. It also didn't help that in the middle of the night, Anakin was bitten by something. As the two brothers exited the alleyway, they walked right into the last thing they needed to get involved in. It was a hostage situation. There was a number of armed individuals holding weapons to a number of hostages, and in front of them were the police. It was a chase scene, and while the police don't typically tread this far down, it was in the service of saving the representatives of Coruscant. They got jumped the night before, and the police had been tracking them here. The individuals who captured them hadn't decided they wanted credits or if they wanted to kill the representatives. Anakin and Zane were shocked to say the least. They stopped at the edge of the alleyway with weapons pointed towards them. Before anyone could say a word, a lightsaber ignited and a bald man wielding a green lightsaber dropped down from the sky and cut down a number of the armed men. Before using the force to throw the others away from the hostages, the Jedi didn't kill any of the armed guard, but he made sure that they didn't kill anyone. With a number of body parts strewn about and police taking the hostages away and capturing the fugitives, the Jedi noticed the children. He walked over and removed his hood with a silly grin. He asked if they were alright, and he looked at Anakin seeing a limp. The Jedi Master introduced himself as Master Harald. His first name was Warclar. He asked if he may take a look at the older one's leg, and they nodded their heads. The brothers were shocked. Of course they knew what a Jedi was, but to see one in person, in action, it was breathtaking. How do you even process what they just saw? It felt unrealistic. Warclaw got down on his knee and looked at the leg and told Anakin that he would get him some help, suggesting that he carry Anakin to a medical facility. When Master Harold got up, he turned around and asked if the police needed anything. They told him that he was free to go. He smiled and picked up Anakin and asked Dane to follow along. Warclaw got their names and asked them what they were doing down here. The Jedi Master was a little confused as to how two orphaned boys from Tatooine ended up here, but he believed that all happens to the Force. He could also sense a natural powerful entity within the Force. He just assumed it was something else, because there was no way one of the boys radiated that much, let alone the two of them combined. Regardless, he got the boys to a small medical facility and checked them in. He told them that he would wait here before heading back to the Jedi Temple. Warclaw couldn't seem to escape this presence through the force that he was feeling, so he simply pulled out a small device off of his belt and asked the two brothers if he could take a blood sample from them. They looked at each other and shrugged, and so he did. While they waited for the doctors to come out and check on Anakin, he was informed by someone inside the temple that these boys had incredibly high midichlorian counts. 
both of them with a higher midichlorian count than Master Yoda. Anakin had the highest, so he was likely the chosen one, but his younger brother was very close. Warclaw told the two of them that he would be taking them back to the Jedi Temple instead. They asked why, and he told them that there was something special about the two of them, and they needed to be taken to the doctors inside the temple to confirm his discoveries. He made sure that they knew it was positive and nothing negative about the situation as a whole. They agreed and they were taken to the Jedi Temple, where they were given to the medical droids to oversee Anakin's recovery. Zane was left without his brother as Master Harold approached the Jedi Council to inform them about what he had discovered in the Undercity. He told them that he found two brothers from Tatooine with incredibly high midichlorian counts. The council was confused, but they were relatively adamant on the fact that they were too old to join the Jedi Order. However, the council was much more trusting of Harold. He was never a disobedient Jedi, and he followed the code very closely. He could make a legitimate case for the brothers to become Jedi, but the council wanted to meet the boys before they made the decision. Hours would pass by, and after Anakin was patched up, the two brothers would be taken by Warclaw up to the council chambers. At this point, he was very unaware of the murder. He just knew that they were orphaned. The council won the tester individual and collective skill. They were seven and five years old, a bit too old in their own opinion to join the Jedi Order. Anakin and Zane did a couple of tests together, and then they were separated. Anakin went first and got everything perfect. Zane followed up and had the same exact score. The council then asked both of them individually about their thoughts on their mother, being that they were aware of their mother's death. Anakin told the council that he missed her, but she was gone. Zane, on the other hand, mentioned how he'd come to peace with it. Anakin was still holding on, like the revenge he had against Watto didn't make up for it. The Jedi were completely unaware of the murder and had no reason to believe that these two kids murdered anyone. The Jedi recognized that Anakin was a little unbalanced, but his younger brother could keep that in check, so, by a slim margin, the Jedi would allow these two kids into the Order. One of the Jedi who was big in favor of the brothers was Jedi Master Sifo Dyas. He suggested that he and his best friend take over the training of the brothers. Before the brothers were accepted into the Jedi Order, the Council decided that there needed to be willing teachers for them. If the Council couldn't find masters that were willing to teach the brothers, then there would be no reason to allow them inside the Jedi Order. Sifo Dyas immediately saw the potential in having the two within the Order, and so he approached his good friend, Master Dooku, and asked if he had any interest in training the boys. Truthfully, Dooku had little to no interest in doing such, but Sifo Dyas had an interesting case. Because Anakin and Zane were brothers, it would be much more efficient to train them as friends. It would also allow them to grow together, and then Sifo Dyas said the magic words. The future of the Jedi belonged to these two brothers. Dooku stopped. He originally had no interest in training the boys, but now that Sifo Dyas mentioned the future, it meant that these boys would likely be the most powerful Jedi the galaxy had ever seen. If they could focus their young minds on what they wanted to fix about the Jedi, then perhaps the Order could be saved. Dooku didn't want to admit it at the time, but his dear old master wouldn't live forever, and if the Skywalker brothers were fully trained, then it wasn't unrealistic to believe that they could fulfill important roles on the High Council in the future. Dooku was in for it, for one reason only, the future of the Jedi. As Qui-Gon always said, he turns to the light because it's there. Dooku felt the same, and he also had no one pushing him away from the Jedi aside from the Jedi themselves. He had little interest in abandoning this path, still believing that the Jedi could be saved. But it didn't start with their past, it started with their future. Dooku told his friend that he would take the older brother. sifo was excited, he would take the younger brother, and so it was decided. With Dooku and sifo taking Anakin and Zane on as their own apprentices. Though that wouldn't come for a little while. Anakin and Zane would be put into the classes with their new peers, and it wasn't initially bad. And it didn't ever really get bad. At their age, they weren't too old, and they didn't really have time to develop any sort of tantalizing personality traits. For the most part, for the kids, Anakin and Zane were sorta of like them. Anakin's demeanor was different from Zane's, and the difference in their personalities was very clear. When they started their training, these differences became more defined. Anakin was a bit at odds with the Jedi Code and he rejected it a lot, simply because he didn't like the way the Code disabled his emotions. However, Zane found a lot of peace with the Jedi Code and the way of the Jedi. Each of the brothers were much different in class. Anakin was a little bit more of a loud individual, who would while making friends in the first few months became a bit of a class clown. His younger brother, who was in the same class, became at odds with this type of behavior and kind of buried his head into the lessons they were required to learn. When they moved on from basic instruction into lightsaber training, the two brothers looked inseparable. They moved the same way, their natural ability with the weapon was a shock to many. However, as they both gained new friends, the two of them started becoming distant from one another. Anakin didn't care for the code or the basic instructions, and it reflected in his work and in his training, and it was a polar opposite for Zane. The best part for the two of them was being able to make friends with their peers. If they weren't able to make friends, it would have been very difficult for the two of them. But the large number of friends each brother was able to accumulate allowed them both to feel comfortable 
comfortable leaving the other brother alone. The rooms were right next to each other, and in the morning, they meditated next to each other, but aside from that, they didn't spend a lot of time with each other. Obviously, when they first started, they couldn't be seen apart, but after a couple years, they were hardly with each other. This did come with some extra short falls, some of them being that they got into heated arguments about their own philosophical views towards the Jedi. Zane agreed about the Jedi not being involved in the Outer Rim, however, he continued to remind Anakin how the Jedi couldn't be everywhere. 10,000 Jedi versus 100 quadrillion sentience wasn't exactly good odds. Anakin refuted that point consistently, and regardless of who was right or wrong, it created a divide between the two brothers. Their feuds transferred over into their sparring matches, which in turn helped them in the long run. Not that they were going to kill each other when they sparred, but they definitely didn't play nice. Anakin typically came out on top, having a higher midichlorian count, being older, and still being bigger than his brother, though Zane, unlike his brother, found these losses to be filled with valuable lessons. Anakin enjoyed the ability to win a spar and then flaunt it in front of Zane's face. As the brothers drifted apart over time, their ideologies began to further apart, and when it came time for Anakin to become a Jedi Padawan, he differed greatly from his younger brother. Anakin was 13 when Dooku took him on as a student, and his ideologies matched perfectly with his mentor. Dooku initially had little excitement, but the minds that Anakin had with him was something that he would cherish as his final student. There was a certain poetry to it all. Yoda's last student and Dooku's last student would be able to issue a systematic change within the Jedi Order. Of course, Dooku had to instill that into Anakin and further develop his training, but you know. The Dooku immediately noted something to Saifo Dias about the difference in the relationship between the two brothers. The two Jedi acknowledged it, and Master Dias thought about how he would approach it as an issue. He suggested the Dooku that they keep them separated but allow them to naturally interact with each other. This didn't seem to be a large issue with Dooku, as he initially believed and originally believed it necessary to split the brothers up once Anakin became his student. During the first few months of Dooku having a new apprentice, he was approached by Senator Palpatine in regards to philosophical conversation. None of these conversations had Anakin present, but it was more so Palpatine trying to get a feel for Dooku, and nothing really transpired from that. They were nothing more than friendly conversations, and Dooku never thought anything more of them. The moment Anakin was Dooku's apprentice, they left the temple. Dooku believing it important to instill a sense of responsibility to serve the people in the galaxy. Doing this, he realized he didn't need to teach that to Anakin because he already had a sense of such responsibility. Anakin talked really openly with Dooku about his past and how much he wanted to help others. He never mentioned it when he was a youngling, but he wanted to make it apparent now, especially with a personal master. Dooku took information to the council to inform them about slavery issues in the Outer Rim, though he had no reason to believe that it would go any further than the words that left his mouth. sifo on the other hand, would begin his formal interactions with Zane. While Zane was still a couple years away from becoming a Padawan, Diaz was very excited about becoming a teacher again. He believed that being a teacher again would enable him to have a wider range of thoughts on the current events around the galaxy and allow him to have a better fixation on his stances inside the council chambers. It sounds far-fetched to begin with, but in his mind, with someone from the next generation with him, it almost made perfect sense. He believed that with a student, he would better understand what a young Jedi saw through their own eyes, and he could use their ideas and thoughts to fuel his own and broaden his own interpretation of the galaxy as a whole. It was rooted in the belief that no master has learned everything, no matter how great or old they might be. When sifo Dias began interacting with Zane, he realized that Zane wasn't anything like his older brother. He was much more reserved, he wore lighter colors, and he had a very calm demeanor. This was respectable, but it was very surprising to say the least. His peers talked about him with great respect, and they always remarked how he seemed to be ahead of his age group. Zane was poised, but he lacked the confidence that his older brother had. Dias wanted to get a better feel for his future pupil, so he talked to him a lot, especially around his feelings. Neither Anakin or Zane mentioned what they did when they were kids. The murder of Watto wasn't very Jedi-like, and it wasn't respected, so they kept it hidden. Anakin moved on from it, still feeling like he could have made Watto hurt a little bit more before he was killed, whereas Zane felt a lot of guilt for it. He couldn't escape it. There was some sort of traumatic block for him, and so in a means to correct his feelings, he overcorrected. He tied himself to the Jedi Code because he believed that it would supersede his own actions. As sifo Diaz learned this, he felt remarkable sadness for Zane. It wasn't just Zane, but Anakin too. However, at this point, it seemed like Anakin had a grip on his own life, which would be further from the truth. Both brothers had a means of dealing with it, and neither were healthy. One of them wasn't even healthy in regards to how the Jedi dealt with things. Zane's interpretation that the code needed to be followed to a T left him feeling even more emptiness than before. 
Cypher Diaz showed him how to correct that particular misconception about the code. Anakin, on the other hand, learned with Dooku that revenge doesn't just solve the issue. While Dooku had plenty of occasions where he crossed the line, Qui-Gon could account for being a part of many of them, Dooku understood that Anakin's method would only hurt him in the long run. Anakin was currently suppressing his emotions, and that wouldn't do him any good. Dooku assisted Anakin with dealing with such issues. Eventually, and even a little before Anakin did, Zayn became sifo Padawan, and their training would begin. While initially Dooku and sifo made a deal that they would train the brothers together, there was no sign of the Skywalker brothers being anywhere near each other anymore. This was because of an argument that broke out between the two of them. What was going on at the moment was the young Jedi silent treatment. Their argument started as most of their arguments started. Zayn saw Anakin using the dark side. His mind immediately went back to the death of his mother. When Anakin himself used the dark side, he thought of the pleasure he had in murdering Watto, but it didn't remind Zayn at all of murdering Watto. There was a miscommunication between the brothers because Zayn critiqued Anakin for using the dark side. Anakin lashed out, and typically, Zane would just let Anakin have the final word, seeing as there was no point to continuing the argument with him. This time, that didn't happen, and the two of them pulled their blades on each other. Dooku and sifo made a point to not bring it up to anyone else, and deal with the issue on a basic level. They did not want to reprimand their students for having basic human emotions, especially considering they were still intent on their students being the future of the Jedi. As the years went by, brothers stayed separated, but they learned a great deal about the Force and the Jedi. Zane became a little bit more relaxed on the code, and realized that through the help of his master, that he was not to blame for what happened to his mother. That using all aspects of the Force were okay, however there was importance of being able to tell the difference between using the dark side and using the Force. Zane was able to easily distinguish the difference, whereas his brother didn't. This was partially due to Dooku's teachings of Anakin. Zane took the basic instructions of sifo and applied them. During these corresponding years, Dooku's former apprentice, Qui-Gon Jinn, would be sent on a mission to Naboo. When he left Naboo to return the Coruscant, their vessel was hit by the Trade Federation. They had to make a stop. But because they were able to find a shop owner who now resided in Wada's former shop, who dealt in Republic credits, they were able to bounce on and off world quickly and get back to Coruscant. This did in turn make Maul fall behind, and after Palpatine secured the role of Chancellor, he didn't kill his master in his sleep. While there was obvious temptations for him to do so, Palpatine, without Dooku, needed someone to run operations on the other side of the Republic. As Supreme Chancellor, he couldn't do it all by himself. As for Palpatine's ideas towards a clone army, they were shut down by his master. Jedi Master sifo didn't have vision or dreams about a coming clone war, because he was preoccupied by a student. So Plagueis suggested that, instead of an elaborate plan to engulf the galaxy in war, they do one of two different things. Neither one of Plagueis' plans were so convoluted or relied so heavily on everything going absolutely perfectly. Plagueis didn't like the idea of a war like the Clone Wars, because there were far too many chances and circumstances in which their control over the situation could be thwarted by a singular mess up. With Plagueis calling the shots, Maul would be even more delayed than he originally was, which would allow Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon to go back to Naboo and Tatooine without ever realizing the Sith had returned. This was again something Plagueis wanted control over. He knew the Jedi were corrupt, but making them aware that the Sith had returned was putting everything up to the circumstance that the Jedi would not try and find them. Even if they wouldn't try, the chance of them trying to find the Sith were extraordinarily high. There was no reason to risk it. Palpatine believed a good risk was necessary, but maybe Darth Plagueis the Wise was wiser than he. Anakin and Zayn would continue their training for years, though they wouldn't be in contact with each other for most of those years. Their rooms still sat next to each other, but they genuinely avoided each other. sifo and Dooku noticed this and tried to forge a plan to get the brothers to get back together, but they just wouldn't. There was bad blood in the water, and it was being maintained by both of them. It was a shame too, because the chance of them growing their strength would be amplified by being around each other. When Anakin and Zayn were in their late teens, they became forced to be reckoned with. sifo and Dooku were terrific teachers, and with sifo maintaining his stay on the High Council, he fell further and further away from the general consensus of the Council itself. Yaddle still had a seat on the Council, as did Plo, but their voices were consistently outnumbered. Zane never thought much about the fact that his master was on the High Council, and over the years, he'd come to terms with sifo himself, seeing a more mature way to view the Code and not hold himself responsible for the actions he committed when he was just a boy, let alone the actions someone committed against his mother. As young adults, Anakin and Zane tried to get back with each other and become brothers again. Again. Their separation didn't take a toll on either of them, especially since they both had friends outside of each other, though they would both be remiss to acknowledge that they both at the very least missed each other, and so when they came back together, the fire that was left behind was reignited, and the two of them went from peaceful discussion to distaste. Anakin believed that Zane was holding himself back and failing his true self by allowing the code to take control. Here they go again. 
Anakin didn't understand at this point that Zayn was using the code as guidelines to be a truer Jedi, something that he got from sifo and something that differed between sifo and Dooku. Anakin's master fit him perfectly, and with another fiery argument the two of them broke off again. The experiment failed, both Anakin and Zayn came to terms with the fact that they might not be brothers again, and that their separation might remain indefinite. As Anakin was closing in on the rank of Jedi Knight, he and his master were sent on a mission to Mygido. There were pop-ups of potential rebellion. Dooku and Anakin weren't the best negotiators in the galaxy, but they got the job done, which is all that really mattered, and so they went. Dooku and Anakin were surprised by the silence that filled the streets of the planet. Mygido was relatively wealthy, or rather, it was known for its wealth. When they arrived, they saw the Sith plan unfolding. However, they were unaware it was a Sith plan. Essentially, the Republic, under Palpatine, was putting the galaxy under an economic chokehold. Plagueis used his power in the banking clans and corporate world to support it. The long-term plan was to strip the people from their power by starving them out and forcing them to become reliant on the corporate alliances. It was a win-win, essentially. Palpatine would continue to gain power in the Senate, and the private corporations and powers such as the Trade Federation, Techno Union, Commerce Guild, and so on would be able to give people what they needed, but at the cost of everything they had. The scheme was brilliant, and it wasn't heavily reliant on a war going perfectly to a T. Plagueis didn't believe the Jedi would ever side with the Republic in a war anyways, and so he never found reason with Palpatine's plan. The people on Mygido were like a couple of other standout people around the galaxy who were trying to rise up. The corporations on Mygido aligned with the government in a means to squander the resistance, and it was working too. When Dooku and Anakin were sent here, they came on behalf of the Republic, a request made by Palpatine, who still at this point had his eyes on Anakin and Zayn. When the two of them arrived, Dooku immediately regretted coming here. He declined any of Palpatine's friendly offers over the years, none of them revealing him to be the Sith Lord, but now Dooku was really beginning to resent Palpatine. While they were here, the two Jedi found themselves a wealthy banker on the planet, Hego Damas II. Dooku was very displeased and he showed a lot of distaste towards Hager from the get-go. The Jedi Master insisted that the Chancellor be brought here immediately so that they could discuss the outrageous behavior of Damask Holdings and the Mygido government that they were upholding. However, Damask suggested that it was all in accordance with the Supreme Chancellor's economic plan for the year. This nearly sent Dooku over the edge, but he informed Damask that he wouldn't continue his conversation with him until the Chancellor was brought here to Mygido to explain it all in person. Hega was genuinely surprised by Dooku's response. He held a lot of respect for Dooku for such a long time, and to have him blast him as such was really a surprise. Now, Hega didn't like Dooku. He was a Jedi. He respected him, though, as an individual. Anakin was kind of confused, and when they exited the room of bureaucrats, he asked what that was all about. Dooku explained the situation to Anakin and told him that he didn't appreciate the direction of the Republic, and even more so the fact that the Jedi were seemingly going along with it. Though because Dooku wasn't on the Council, he didn't realize that it was untrue. The Council was very unhappy with the direction the Republic had made in the last couple years, especially under Palpatine. However, they kept the status quo until they could find a chink in the system. Palpatine was bad for the people, and the people are who the Jedi needed to protect. They made cases of Palpatine about the slaves in the Outer Rim, but he continuously neglected to care about it, and the Jedi as a force couldn't take on all the crime rings by themselves. They did it before the Zygerians years ago, but that was just the Zygerians. Now it was the Huts, the Pikes, the Black Sun, and the Zygerians at the same time, and that would be too much. They wanted to accomplish it, but with as little casualties as possible, and because Palpatine didn't back them, they couldn't escape it. sifo on the other hand, had been proposing either slipping away from the Republic, or even going as far as a hostile takeover. But the Council agreed that the hostile takeover wouldn't be in favor of the survival of the Order. It was a tough bind. Their job on the Council was to ensure the safety and protection, not just of their feathered brothers and sisters inside the Order, but of the people in the galaxy. Dooku begrudgingly informed the Council about the developments on Mygido, and Master sifo was sent, along with him, his student Zane. Anakin was currently 19 and Zane was 17, but sifo believed it was time for Zane to become a Jedi Knight. He hadn't proposed it yet, but it's how he felt in regards to his student. sifo and Zane mounted up and made their way for Mygido, though by the time they got there, they realized how dire the situation had become. The Republic was bathing in money, but the point where people were secretly eager for revolution. A Jedi takeover might actually at this point be welcomed. The two Jedi made their way for the capital building of the city, and then they entered, and they heard the sounds of lightsabers. Ah yes, Dooku's negotiating skills, which were more hostile than ever. It didn't work, especially on Sith Lords. Plagueis and Palpatine were here with each other, when Dooku drew his lightsaber and attempted to force choke one of them. And then it didn't work. And then the Sith didn't really appreciate that. Anakin and Dooku were in a gridlock, with the Master and Apprentice of the Sith. 
Plagueis and Palpatine were incredible warriors, and Anakin was barely holding his own. But Dooku, he was something else. He was most certainly old by this point, but he was remarkable with his blade. Dooku was protecting his student, and that was until a third Sith entered the fray. A Zabrak warrior who, despite his age, moved like a monster. Both Jedi stammered, and when the sound of two more lightsabers ignited, the Sith drew their attention to sifo and Zane. Anakin smiled. He was super happy to see his brother. For the first time in years, their issues with each other dissipated, and they were brothers once more. sifo and Zane were confused. Palpatine and Hega were Sith? They both moved into their stances. sifo used Form 4, and Zane used Form 5. Dooku was a brilliant user of Form 2, but his apprentice practiced and utilized Form 7. The Jedi made sure they got close with each other. They had the numbers advantage, but sifo realized that Dooku was struggling. These Sith were nothing to scoff at. The Jedi pulled together, and then they prepared for the battle. It was silence. Two lines. Sith and Jedi. The face down of the century, even millennia, brought to the forefront of history by Jedi not acting like Jedi. The battle began. Dooku moved in swiftly, his blade as speedy as anything the Sith had ever seen. He moved and spun under swings and behind others. Anakin jumped at Plagueis, but the Sith Lord wasn't having any of it. His blade spun around his back, and then he parried Anakin. sifo moved in on Sidious to help his friend, and Zane was left with the speedy Darth Maul. Both Skywalker brothers were out of their element, both extremely talented, but this fight against the Sith is something neither of them could have prepared for. Maul's double-bladed weapon made him quite the opponent for Zane. His own aggressive form was caught off by Maul's overly aggressive use of the lightsaber. Maul had something to prove here, his first confrontation with the Jedi in forever, and he needed to prove to Sidious that he was worthy of remaining his apprentice. Sidious was almost ready to off Plagueis, everything in their plans had almost been finalized and it was time for one Sith Lord to rule the galaxy. Blades echoed across the room. Dooku and sifo struggled against the powerhouse of Sidious. He used two lightsabers, and his remarkable speed and strength was nothing to scoff about. The Jedi worked extremely hard to ensure they didn't get outmatched, but it was becoming increasingly difficult for them to handle. Anakin was struggling against Plagueis, but despite him being half the duel as Palpatine was, experience outranks everything. Zane could feel that his brother was struggling, and in a daring move, he shoved Maul forward and whipped his blade across the room. The blade smacked across Plagueis' blade that he was trying to bring down on Anakin, and it threw him off. Zane pulled the blade back into his hands just in time to block a strike from Maul. Anakin used this to his advantage, thrusting his blade forward at Plagueis, putting him off balance. The Sith Lord felt his grip slipping, so he did the unspeakable. Every Jedi and Sith had an unspoken rule of combat, and Plagueis broke that rule right here. He deignited his lightsaber as Anakin swung at him, and reignited it and blasted Anakin across the upper chest and across his face. Anakin fell backwards in immense pain. It was a dishonor for a Sith to do that, to win without truly beating one's opponent. It was ill-placed by the Sith Lord. Sidious saw it and it made his rage grow, but right now he needed to be the best and beat these two Jedi before he focused on killing his master. Zane was thrown from his feet by Maul, who used a powerful three-point saber combo against him. Dooku had enough of this. His lightsaber parried twice before slicing through one of Palpatine's blades. Dooku spun around the back of sifo and used electricity, not force judgment, on Plague, sending the Sith Lord across the room in a pile of steam. Anakin lay on the ground with smoke rolling off of his cut, but this gave him enough time to regather his composure to protect himself. Zane used his arms to backpedal, narrowly avoiding strikes made by Maul. One of the strikes nearly ripped his leg from his body, leaving Zane to kick his foot forward. It gave him enough time to grab his lightsaber and get to his feet again. Zane blocked a couple of strikes before being pinned against the wall with a lightsaber, glaring against his face. He turned his head away from the bright light, trying to avoid being cut. Maul was physically stronger than Zane in just about every way. Anakin saw this and he grabbed his blade like a spear and lifted himself up into the air and thrusted the blade through Maul's back. When the blade went through, it didn't connect with Zane, who ducked out of the way. Anakin stumbled. He was very weak from the cut, but he was managing. He helped his little brother up. The two of them felt like kids again. The same way, Anakin lifted Zane up after Shmi's death. They held each other's forearms for a moment, and a singular moment of solitude before they turned their attention to the Sith Lord Plagueis, who had blood in his eyes. Sidious was keeping up, but Dooku and sifo were beginning to prove too much for him. Plagueis jumped up on the table and pointed his blade at the two Jedi. He grinned. He had the high ground. Both Skywalkers moved in slowly. Before they could strike, Maul's double-bladed lightsaber ignited and spun around in Plagueis' hands. He smashed the two blades against the Jedi Padawans, his speed and ferocity matching what Sidious displayed on an easy day. Plagueis jumped down and his blades were driven forwards towards the young Jedi as they protected themselves as best as possible. Anakin and Zane were quick on their feet. Plagueis' main blade was cut out of his hand by Anakin, which wasn't the best target. The Sith Lord may have not frequently used a double-bladed weapon, but he was a beast with it. 
He spun the blade around in his hand and threw Anakin from his feet before spinning it back around and driving it through Zane's torso. The weapon, luckily, was only off by a couple inches. Zane tumbled back to the ground, his skin and internal organs burning from the searing pain. Plagueis prepared to make a move on sifo and Dooku so that Palpatine could survive, but Dooku's swiftness with the blade and sifo assistance proved to be far too much for the younger Sith Lord. Plagueis was disgusted, but sifo turned around to block a strike by the Master. sifo knew that Plagueis cheated, and as a Sith Lord backpedaled to take on the still standing Skywalker, he tried the same trick, this time nearly cutting Anakin down. However, because it was used on him moments before, he was able to defend himself against it. When sifo jumped across the room, Plagueis moved to defend himself, but sifo deignited his weapon, causing Plagueis to miss his parry, leaving him completely defenseless. sifo drove the weapon through Plagueis' chest, killing him immediately. All three of the Sith were dead, and so was their religion. The Jedi all turned to Zane, who was still on the ground, and rushed to his side. He was in a lot of pain, and none of them knew if he would make it or not, but they quickly moved to him and got him to one of the various medical facilities on the planet. He was put under, but woke up hours later to be healing relatively well. The blade cut through some of his organs, but not badly enough where it would be lethal. The blade couldn't have been off by a centimeter. Anakin waited for Zane to wake up, while the council members Sifo Dyas and Master Dooku informed the Jedi Council of what had happened. Mace Windu and Plo Koon were being sent to Mygido to resolve the investigation, while the rest of the council prepared for what would likely be referred to as a hostile takeover of the Republic. When Zane woke up, Anakin got to his side and asked how he was doing. Zane told him that he was doing alright, which was to be expected after being stabbed, not for nothing. Anakin apologized for everything that happened over the last couple years, and how they distanced themselves. Zane coughed a little bit, but he told Anakin there was no reason to apologize. Anakin asked why, and Zane chuckled a little bit. He told him that they were supposed to argue. Their brotherhood could never be perfection. All that mattered is that when the going got rough, they had each other. Anakin thought for a little bit, and then realized how right he was. No matter how many disagreements they had over the years, when it mattered the most, they had each other's backs, even at the risk of losing their lives. Not a thing had changed since they were on Tatooine. They didn't have to be best friends all the time, or even get along all the time. All that mattered is that when they needed each other, they had each other. They'd hug it out, but it might hurt too much, so they didn't. Dooku and sifo would eventually enter the room to see how Zane was doing, and they both informed their students that their valor and their unbridled determination was not something that could be taught. Rather, it was who they were. They inspired the two masters, and their hard work was the work of true Jedi Knights. Anakin and Zane both smiled. Both of them had a little bit of recovering to do. Anakin's face and collar would have some healing that needed to be done, but he would be alright. When the four Jedi returned the Coruscant, the Jedi had taken control over the Republic, and they stated why they were doing this. They saw that the Republic was selling itself out to the various corporations, and they would not support the people collectively suffering. Everyone was on edge, especially the people who were being starved out of their necessities. But the Jedi, they now look like heroes. The reality being that the Sith could have very easily maintained the status quo with their plan, and they would have had a grip on the entire galaxy that would have provided great power and insurmountable credits. But with the Sith dead, and the Jedi calling on the Republic to make a 180 on legislation, the galaxy reaped the benefits of it. The Jedi also acknowledged how this was not their place, but they could not stand by it any longer. Mace Windu and Yoda proceeded over the Senate for several months. After Mace and Plo recovered the bodies of the Sith and disposed of them and their ancient religion, they ensured the Jedi were set in place to be the heroes of the story. Without Dooku joining Sidious, public trust for the Jedi was at an all-time high. However, while the people may have been grateful for the Jedi, many politicians and most of the private corporations and groups were not. They even put bounties out on Jedi, but they didn't come to fruition. The guilds all set in place by Plagueis had a means to deploy massive amounts of armies against the Republic and the Jedi, but they missed one key thing. People funded their empires. If people stopped, then they would lose everything. With the Jedi having control over the Republic, they were able to boost smaller organizations to ensure the people weren't sucked into the corporate greed. The system was so out of place because of the Sith that it would take years to recover, but a public boycott of the Trade Federation, Techno Union, Commerce Guild, and many other banking groups allowed the Jedi's plan to rip apart what the Sith had established. The collective people outweighed the corporate alliances. These alliances forgot that without the people, they had no money. And with people moving away from the alliances, their pockets quickly emptied out, and they suffered because of it. Their threats against the people became as hollow as they were as individuals. The Jedi remained in place with control over the Republic, and as more information came out about Palpatine's neglect of the Jedi's propositions, they were heralded as heroes in the galaxy. The Jedi were able to fund all this by just emptying out the bank accounts of the Senate and the banking clans, where all the Republic's money was. It was a genius scheme, not for nothing, but it was built on the pillars of sand. 
Anakin and Zane return to the temple as heroes, and once again as brothers. Their heroics would be the stuff of legends, and all the while they were simply Jedi Knights, and they both found an interest in becoming teachers. Zane firstly, especially because he believed it was the next step on his journey as a Jedi, and so Zane would take on Ahsoka Tano. The age difference between Zane and Ahsoka was really close. He was only three years older than her, which might make people feel like he was inadequate to teach, but their dynamic worked out really well. Everything Zane learned from Saipo Dyas allowed him to come to Ahsoka as a wise teacher. His experience with his brother would also garner him a lot of experience with people like Ahsoka. About two years later, Anakin would take on a young Twi'lek student in the name of Desha Numa. By the time Anakin started teaching Daisha, the Republic was handed back over to the people, not to be mistaken for politicians. Emphasis on the people of the Republic rather than the politicians. By this point, the Council was emptying out its traditional Jedi. Obi-Wan Kenobi became a Jedi Master in this time, and his master Qui-Gon Jinn inspired Dooku to join him on the High Council. Dooku and Qui-Gon replaced Kiari Mundi, who stepped down, and Yariel Poof, who had died. With the Council rapidly changing in a forward direction, behind the influence of Saifo Dyas, the Jedi Order changed their ways. This was especially because of Mace Windu suggesting, and even more forcing, the vote of the Council to move away from the politics of the Republic. Mace was very pro-Jedi, and he wanted to stay that way. With their work done in the Republic, he and Plo suggested the Order spread out. The established Council would stay on Coruscant, but Master Obi-Wan Kenobi would lead a new resurgence of Jedi in the Outer Rim. The Jedi hadn't been that far out in the galaxy since the fall of Jedha City during the High Republic. Obi-Wan would take Anakin and Zane along with their students to be accompanied by Kit Fisto, Depa Balaba, and Aayla Sakura, as well as Master Quinlan Vos, who was an experienced Jedi in the Outer Rim and Mid-Rim. The Jedi Outpost would be placed on Rhodia. The placement would be perfect, close to terrible spots in the Outer Rim like Tatooine, but close enough to get somewhere if need be. With the corporate alliances falling out of power and the new Chancellor of the Republic in Padme Amidala calling for their arrests, the galaxy would change indefinitely. The surrendering of power and greed to corporate groups would never happen again. There was bad blood for Padme being that the Trade Federation had invaded Naboo, but she put that behind her and targeted these groups to ensure they would never rise again. She also directed funds to assist the Jedi in recapturing the Outer Rim on behalf of the Republic. Ahsoka and Daisha would become as close as sisters as Anakin and Zane were brothers. The Skywalker brothers would become very close with Obi-Wan Kenobi, who was splitting the command of the group up between himself, Depa Balaba, and Quinlan Vos. The Outer Rim over the span of a decade would be unrecognizable, as wars engulfed the criminal empires. Similarly to how the Jedi thwarted the Zygerians, they did the same again. With the Republic behind them, Mace Windu, Plo Koon, Sifo Dyas, Dooku, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Quinlan Vos, Anakin, Zane, and Kit Fisto would become known as Outer Rim Legends. Their work against the Huts, Pikes, Black Suns, and Zygerians would free trillions of people from oppression. As the corporate alliances and criminal empires faded from existence, the Republic would begin to thrive unlike ever before. For the Skywalker brothers, they would return to Tatooine, especially during the war that crippled the Huts, to make peace with their pasts. Both Anakin and Zane came to terms with everything that happened when they were just boys. Anakin got over his need to exact more revenge on Watto, and Zane got over the fact that some things need to be left behind, especially if one can better themselves from learning from them. Anakin and Zane's students would become some of the best Jedi in the outpost. Ahsoka and Desha had great teachers, and it also helped that their lineage came through Dooku and Saifo Dyas. As they became Jedi Knights and the brothers became masters, they joined Kenobi and Voss on the Outpost Council. They would then receive word that the Jedi were going to sprout out even more, and so both brothers took their former students and split up with Obi-Wan Kenobi for the northern half of the galaxy. They placed their temple on Megiddo. The reason Obi-Wan was sent with them was because he was accredited for helping set up the Jedi Outpost on Rhodia, so the Outpost on Megiddo would be run by Obi-Wan and the two brothers. A couple other Jedi would join them and start a new outpost. Over the years, both Sifo Dyas and Dooku would pass away from natural deaths, and joining them in the Cosmic Force would be Grandmaster Yoda. To replace Yoda, Plo Koon would ascend to the rank of Grandmaster, and by his side would be Master of the Order Mace Windu. With the Republic saved from the cusp of war, and a Jedi Order retrofitted for a new era, the galaxy brought into the beginning of the Gilded Republic, greatly in part to the gift from the Force of the Skywalker Brothers. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our story. Again, special thanks to Galvin Gaming, Tristan, Darth Revan, Pimp Daddy Bane, the Last Jedi, Apollo, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Jedi Sloth, Mad Night Studios, Anakin 003, Lemon Knight, Rex the Wolf, the man with three first names, Dark Saint 46, Flan Bassis, and Lord Deadwing for supporting the channel. Smash that like button. Let's talk about our story real quick. Before we actually get into the diagnosis of the video itself, uh, for those of you that really like the intro to this, where they're on Tatooine, 
and haven't seen what if Anakin was never discovered, go check out that video. Otherwise, something new will be coming up with this thumbnail, so stay tuned for that. Anyways, the story itself was really fun. Having a story like this was something that could be really fun for me, but I also really wanted to make sure that I set this story apart from anything else I've done before. So in Anakin Never Discovered, he's obviously never discovered. And in another video that's coming up at some point, it's not gonna be similar to this at all. And so I wanted to set it up where Anakin and Zane go into the Jedi Order at some point. Now, Zane comes from a name, I forget which language it's from, but it means light. Uh, that's where the name come from, came from, it means light, and that's kind of what I wanted him to be. I wanted him to be light, um, and that's why he's so Jedi involved. There's a little thing for you there. Those little Easter eggs typically will appear in videos, I just don't talk about them, but for this one, Zane just means light. And I wanted the two brothers to have a traumatic experience, a traumatic bond, but I wanted them to separate. Now, if this was like a two and a half hour video, like what if Anakin was never discovered, I would go more in depth about their arguments about how they separated. But the main the main point being is that I wanted to focus on on the brotherhood between the two of them. How how brothers can never be perfect, but no matter what, if you pick on my brother, I'm gonna beat you up. Like that kind of whole vibe going on there. It's like I might not get along with you, but I'm still going to stick with you if someone's going against you, you know? And so I wanted that vibe to kind of feel really vibey. But one thing that I have to say is my favorite element of this, and probably why this story is sitting up there really pretty high for me right now in recent videos, is the Sifo-Dyas, Zane, and Dooku Anakin vibe. That, that whole thing is just really fun to me. We've done What If Anakin Was Trained by Dooku, but I really wanted to kind of put Dooku and Anakin together in this again, and allow sifo to have a, point, a part in this. And I think I think that worked really well in the story, and it was a lot of fun to have both of those characters have a really important part because Dooku is a side character, but Saifo Dias gets mentioned like once every blue moon, and I really wanted him to have a role in the story, and I think I think that was accomplished. So I really hope you all enjoyed this story. This was fun. This was epic. Anyways, I love you all. Spread the love, and always remember, my friends, may the Force be with you.